and I'm Jason Walsworth. I'll be your online host today. Thanks for joining us for worship at Temple here. It's going to be a great day of worship. We've already had an amazing uh, time of worship together, and we know this service is going to be uh, wonderful. We have another baptism to celebrate. We actually celebrate a baptism in every worship service this morning, so praise God for that. Our pastor's back in the pulpit, and uh, he's going to be continuing his sermon series called Following Jesus. Uh, what it really means. And we'll be in Matthew 6 this morning. So get your Bibles out. Get ready to worship with us. Uh, we know it's going to be a great day. And uh, I'll be posting some comments and some links in the comment section. So be sure and like uh, and share this uh, stream so others may want to tune in and join us. Uh, but I'll be posting some links. If you're new to Temple, uh, you can take a moment just to fill out a digital communication card for us and let us know who you are. We'd be happy to follow up with you if you have any questions or if you need to respond to the message you hear today from God's Word. Also, if we can pray for you, uh, you can text NEEDS to 97000 this morning. And uh, we'd love to pray with you or for you about something going on in your life. And then lastly, if you'd like to give as part of your worship, uh, I'll post a giving link uh, there in just a few minutes. And I'll be back after the service to uh, wrap up our time together and give you a few announcements. So let's go into the sanctuary for worship now. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory.
lift up our praise to him. Faithful through the ages. Oh, the God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, your faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain. Steadfast, and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to come on. Does he be good to you? Great is your faithfulness to me. Yes, it is, God. Great is your faithfulness to me. To the setting, same I will praise your Lord. Yes, I will, Lord. Great is your faithfulness to me. Oh, I've seen it in my life. I've seen his faithfulness in my life. He's shown it to me. time if he has been good to you this morning and you've seen his faithfulness demonstrated in your life over and over what else can we do but praise him in this place you guys can go ahead and grab a seat we're going to celebrate baptism together amen do you believe god is faithful 
tell you, we are so grateful because we know our God who is faithful sent to us the best thing he could ever give us, his son, the Lord Jesus, who died for us and rose again. And through him, we are able to have salvation and life. Today, we are able to come with Reese Whitlock. And Reese, uh, you know, as I think about her, I think about her family, it's one of those ways which we get to partner with families because Reese is parents of course are active here and able to share faith their own faith with Reese and actually I know y'all talked about faith Reese you and your parents together and then we get to have camps and Bible school and those kinds of things where God works in people's lives and I know this summer was a summer where Reese came to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and Reese we're proud of you we're grateful for what God has done in your life and we're praying for you as you grow in him in the days to come so today it's in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, that I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. And isn't God good? Oh, rewind. Isn't God good? Amen. Whenever we have an opportunity to witness and celebrate believers' baptism, it should be a time that we can praise God as a church family. Uh, if this is your first time joining us and worshiping with us today, I say welcome. Uh, my name is George. I'm the Minister of Community Engagement here at Temple Baptist Church. And here at Temple, we exist to see every member growing in Christ, connecting in community, and engaging in mission. I want to say a special welcome to the G-Men. We have the GSU G-Men worshiping with us. If you would help me uh, to celebrate to celebrate them. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we want to know that you're here. We don't want to just uh, have you come in and ease out. We actually want to connect with you. And so one of the ways that we've given you an opportunity to do that is through the tear-off in our order of worship. You can tear that off, you can fill that out, and you can leave that in your pew or place that in the offering plate when you leave. You can also do that digitally by texting NEW to TEMPLE to 97000. Again, we want to connect with you. You can also text NEEDS to 97000 to send us your prayer request directly as well. I have the privilege of leading us in our prayer time uh, this morning. And, and this morning, we want to pray and we want to cover the campus of Gremlin State University as they prepare to start classes tomorrow. I know uh, our, our tech uh, family members, they're going to be starting in a few weeks, but we want to cover the Gramlin State University campus in prayer. And I want us to pray specifically for three things this morning as we pray. Number one, I want us to pray for safety, safety for the campus. We want, we want to pray for physical safety. We want to pray that God would, would cover and keep uh, the campus from violence, uh, from accidents and incidents. Uh, we want to pray that God would strengthen uh, the law enforcement officers on campus, the campus police. We want to pray for safety. Secondly, we want to pray for the success of the GSU campus. We want, we want students to do well academically, and we want students to excel athletically. We want to pray for the success of the campus, that God will continue to bring resources that are needed uh, to do what God has purposed and planned uh, for the campus to do on the campus and in the community. And then lastly, uh, most importantly, we want to pray for salvation. We want to pray that students, faculty, and staff will come to know Jesus, will come to have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because that is the most important decision that any of us will ever make. And so we want to just take a moment uh, to pray this morning. And so let's pray for the safety, let's pray for the success, and let's pray for the salvation of Grambling State University. Let's take a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are worthy to be praised. 
Lord, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, there is nobody like you. And we praise you, Lord. Father, before we ask you for anything, Lord, we just want to take a moment to thank you for everything. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your promises, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for never turning your back on us. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your favor. Lord, and we come to you today as a church family, as a body of believers, lifting up the Gramlin State University campus. Lord, we ask that you would cover and protect those who serve and work on the campus. Lord, your, your word says that they that build a house labor in vain if they don't build it without with, with you. Lord, unless you watch over the city, the guards guard it in vain. And so, Lord, we need you. Lord, I lift up the campus police department and I pray that you would give them an extra measure of strength to do what it is that you've called them to do on the campus, ensuring the safety of so many there. Lord, I ask that you would help the campus to succeed in a way that glorifies you. Lord, I pray that students would continue to excel academically as well as athletically and that they would ever be so quick to give you the glory because it is you and you alone who brings prosperity. And then Father, lastly, God, we ask for salvation. Lord, we ask for salvation for the students, faculty, and staff of Gramlin State University. Father, we know that the most important decision we will ever make is to put our faith and our trust in you. And so, Father, I pray that in some way, whether it be through a student or whether it be through a campus ministry, Lord, or whether it be through the local church, God, that you would draw those who are far from you closer to you, Father, that they might be snatched from the clutches of hell, God, and ushered into the kingdom for your glory. God, I, I pray for a revival to take place on campus that starts on the campus, spreads into the city, and spreads around the world because of what you will do. God, and we'll be ever so quick to give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Because, Lord, you and you alone are worthy of it. So, Father, we love you, we honor you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to continue singing this morning. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus here this morning, you have a testimony. You have a testimony about how God has delivered you from spiritual darkness. And he's called you into his marvelous light. And this is the testimony we all share. So we're going to declare it together. I'm a living proof of what the mercy of God can do. If you knew me then, you'd believe me now, and he turned my whole life upside down. He took the old and he made it new. That's just what the mercy of God can do. We can sing this together. No, I'm alive to tell the story. How I've overcome It's His goodness and mercy And the power of His blood And I'm so glad that my freedom It wasn't based on what I've done But the goodness and mercy And the power of His blood There's so much power in the blood Trusting in his blood. Oh, I thought I deserve oh, to be six feet beneath the earth. For all the things I've done, the things I've said, the choices made that I regret. It's 
his goodness and mercy and the power of his blood and i'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what i've done but the goodness and mercy and the power of his blood the cross meant for me that my Savior carried. Now I've been made free by the mercy of God. Was the grave meant for me where my sin lay buried. Now I stand redeemed by the mercy. Come on, we sing that together. Was the cross meant for me that my Savior carried? Now I've been made free by the mercy of God. Was the grave meant for me where my sin lay buried? Now I stand redeemed by the mercy. morning and we confess it is nothing in our hands that we have brought no good works that we've done this week or in our past no good deed that we've done nothing that we've done for the community nothing that we've done for our family God that hasn't earned our way to salvation it was the power of your precious blood that you shed on the cross and it was the victorious day where you rose again on the third day as the roaring lion of Judah, declaring our victory. And you tell us, those that believe in that power, the power of the cross, those that confess their sin and commit their way to following you, God, when we stand before the Father, he will not look upon our unrighteous works, the bad things, the worst things that we've done. But Jesus, you tell us that the Father on that day, we come to him in judgment, Father, will look upon the sacrifice that you made for us. Oh God, the freedom that we have in this place is not based on what we've done, but it's based on your righteousness, Jesus. And that is where our hope is this morning. 
Our hope is not in our ability to do anything. Our ability to go out, be powerful in our own strength. Our hope is in your ability, Jesus. Your ability to save. Your ability to have us as your own. We are your children. You are our God. Who else could we exalt in this place but you? You, Lord, have worked in us and you've called us into a better life, a life full of joy and a life full of living for your glory. And that's what living is, God. And that's what we commit our way to this morning. Speak to us as we open up your word. Speak through Dr. Reggie. We just want to fall before you and continue to worship you because you're so worthy of it, God. We exalt you in this place. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. It's great to see you all here. I invite you to take your copy of the scripture if you have it this morning and find the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. In a few moments, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4, the first four verses of that sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. I just want to echo again what George said earlier, Coach Jackson, team. We're grateful to have you all with us today. It is a great privilege for us at Temple to host you all and to pray for you all and to look forward to a good season for you all and and see what, what God is going to continue to do in each and every individual life. We're grateful that you're here today. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 really deal with our motivation, deals with who we are and our attitudes. You know, I finally started figuring out my kids. They're from the age 19 to down to 10. Some of you may not know this, but I have four kids, 19, the oldest, 10, the youngest. And I'm, I'm just now really figuring them out. I'm a slow learner. I wish my parents would have talked to me a little bit about what to expect, but I think they wanted me to find out for myself. One of the things that I found out is that my kids can have all kinds of different motivations. They can have all kinds of different attitudes about them. You know, when my kids, when they were younger, they would come to me and they would look and they would say, Da, I love you. Da, you are awesome. And used to, I would gloat in that just a little bit, you know, kind of deal. And then I realized when they came to me like that, they were most likely wanting something. Like, they were wanting something to happen. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you, I hate to tell some of you are about to cry right now because you just figured that out about your kids. But they, they wanted to come and they wanted to get something out of me. They wanted to have, like, a friend over. They wanted to go to a friend's house. They wanted to go to a movie. They were just trying to, like, soften me up so that they could ask the question. I also could tell something was up when I heard a flurry of activity upstairs. Usually upstairs in my house, my kids, it seems like they're not even breathing sometimes. I wonder where they are. But when I hear a flurry of activity and there's no screaming at one another, so there's no fighting going on, that means that they must be like cleaning up their room. And if they're cleaning up their room, it's miraculous to one degree. And it's because they're wanting something out of me. Like they're like, hey, dad, we cleaned up our room. Now can we buy that video game? Now can we do this? Any of you, anybody could give a testimony today? Any of you there with me? You know, they learn that at a young, young age. Motivations matter. Attitudes matter. Jesus has already told us that in Matthew chapter 5. For the last few months, we've been looking through the Sermon on the Mount, which began in Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus talks a lot about the heart. Talks a lot about the attitude. He'd already told them that, hey, some of you are there because you want to keep a to-do list. It's about legalism. You've heard it said that you should not commit adultery, but then Jesus said, I say unto you, if you committed lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery, right? Because he said it's not just about the action, it's about the attitude that leads to the action. He says, I'm concerned about your internal, not just your external." And Jesus is like that. See, if Jesus would just leave us alone, if Jesus would be just, hey, Jesus, just back off a little bit. We're doing the practice. We're doing what you ask us to do. Why you got to worry about our attitudes and our motivations now? Because I'm telling you that Jesus wants to change us from our inside to our outside. He wants to lodge in our hearts in such a way that we will be different we live from day to day. 
So for the Pharisees and the scribes that he addressed earlier in Matthew chapter 5, a lot of them were doing it just because that's what they were supposed to do. That's what they were doing. That's just, that's the to-do list. We're supposed to do these things. And don't get me wrong, I believe in obedience. I believe that if God says it, you ought to do it. End of, end of the story. But you don't do it just because you got to do it. There should be a change within you. And Jesus had already addressed the legalist, and now he addresses those who really are just doing it so that they will be noted by the people around them. That their testimony, whatever their actions, their righteous deeds would be noticed. And Jesus now calls them out about that. Look in verse 1 of that 6th chapter of Matthew. Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites, as they do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your char charitable deed may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So Jesus begins to use these examples of righteousness, spiritual disciplines, if you will. First, in this passage, he will speak to almsgiving or generosity. The people were taught that you ought to be generous. The Jewish mind, they knew that they should invite strangers, the fatherless, and the widows, that there should be a sense of taking care of those individuals. And it was right. It's what they should practice. So here he says, I want to talk to you about doing that. Now, he'll also talk about praying. There, If you'll look, like in verse 5, he'll talk about prayer. Verse 16, he'll talk about fasting. Because these three things, giving, praying, and fasting, these were spiritual disciplines that had to be emphasized by the Jews. They believed that you ought to practice these things. And Jesus said, but as you practice them, you need to check your motivation of why you're doing it. Yes, the practice is good, but the pretense is not. See, the issue was not with the practice. The issue was not with the action itself. The problem was with the pretense or the attitude that the people had behind them as they would fulfill these pillars of righteousness. So I want to ask you this morning, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Especially when you think about your righteousness, your living out what is right and good. Why do you do what you do? Well, you say, Reggie, done the right thing. That's great. But have you done it for the wrong reason? Because God is not just concerned about the right thing. He's concerned about the right reason as well. Isn't that what Jesus is saying here? He said, don't do it like them. Oh, you're going to do it. You are going to do it. Notice this. He assumes that they're going to give generously. He says, you just don't do it like they're doing it. Because they're seeking to please men. And you should be seeking to please God. Notice verse 1 again. He says that they, that these individuals, they have done these righteous deeds to be seen by these men. They've done it in front of the men to be seen by these men. When I was studying this week, I noticed that word that is translated to be seen. It is theathenai, theathenai in the Greek. Listen to that word again, theathenai. We get an English word from that word. The English word is theater. In other words, they're practicing religious theater. That's what they're doing. It's like they're actors. It's like they're trying to live it out and act it out on a stage in front of everybody else so that the crowd will applaud them. Actually, in verse 2, what does he call these kinds of individuals? He calls them hypocrites. Now, the word hypocrite, when you break it down, means to judge under. In other words, it's kind of like you're living under this mask and you're judging everybody else kind of deal. 
in the Greek world, the word hypocrite actually became synonymous with actor. The word hypocrite would be used of the actors on the stage. And these actors, what they would do is they would have these masks and they would put the mask up in front of their face and the, the mask would communicate what they would want communicated, right? It was their public image. So he says, he, he, he combines this word for theater with this word of hypocrite and he says, really, again, the reason you're doing this, the reason you're trying to practice your righteous deeds is so that people will be impressed by you. Verse 2, he says, Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets. Especially when it comes to their giving. He says, don't sound the trumpet. Hey, you know that's where we get the saying, don't toot your own horn. You know that, right? Like, that's where it is. Jesus gives us a lot of this stuff. He says, don't toot your own horn. Don't blow a trumpet. Now, what were they doing? I mean, the, the religious leaders would come and they would give. How were they drawing attention to themselves? Because I don't think they were literally blowing trumpets from my understanding of the way the synagogue worked. So what is he saying? He's like using exaggerated language of saying, hey, don't call attention to yourself. How would they call attention to themselves? Well, in the process of giving itself, you could draw attention from others. For example, in all the synagogues, they had like little receptacles where people would give. You would come in, you could give to the alms, uh, that is to help people. You could give your tithe, you could give different ways, uh, but they would have little receptacles. Now, this is not one of the original synagogue receptacles. You can tell that. When I walked in this morning, some people said, are you baking a cake today or what are you doing? I said, just hold on. I'll try to show you. So this is not New Testament age. This is like 21st century age and it's out of my wife's kitchen. And she told me when I walked out this morning, you better bring that back. I said, yes, ma'am. It will happen. But in the bottom of the receptacles were like this metal. So when people would come, remember what they also, how, what did they have as their currency? Coins, right? They didn't have paper money like, well, some of us don't even have paper money anymore. We got like plastic money or plastic credit cards kind of stuff. We don't even take money. But back then they had the coins. That's what they used. So let's say I'm the big cog in the synagogue. I'm brother so-and-so. And I come in. And I'm going to give mine. Everybody hear that? Did you hear what I gave today? You realize that's the reason they knew about the widow's might. Remember when the widow comes in and she just gives something? You realize that's how they could tell that she just gave one. Because listen, it's not impressive. Not to men and to women that are in the congregation. Ah, oh, but when you're able to give all that, it was like sounding the trumpet. Everybody look at me. Hear what I've just done. See what I just did. And then they would be esteemed. And Jesus said that's the reason they gave it too, so you'd see them. So what, do we should, what should we do as we think about this passage? Because there's some of us who struggle with this. One... You and I need to practice self-examination in our own hearts and lives. Listen to what Jesus said again in verse 1. He said, take heed. In some of your translations, it will say, beware. It's in the present tense in the original language, which means you better go on checking up. It doesn't mean that you can have one moment like where you've checked up and you said, I'm good for the next year. This is not where God comes and says, I want to do an annual performance review on you, I'm going to sit down with you and I'm going to tell you just right now what's going on and then you're good for the next year. God doesn't do that. You and I need to continually look at the attitudes of our heart, look at the motivations of our heart every day, every day we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Why do we do what we do? Why do we practice such righteousness? Now this is the problem. According to Jeremiah, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That means when you and I go and look at the heart and attitudes, we can oftentimes justify it ourselves because our heart's already deceiving us. 
right? Hey, you, you, you know that other people can tell you got an attitude problem before you even know you got an attitude problem, right? Right? Because you're so self-deceived. Like, look, my wife, she knows when my attitude's out of whack. Oh, I didn't mention this earlier, but you know she also has called on to me in life because I do the same thing that the kids do. Like if I want to go to a ball game or I want to go hunting to the camp or something like that, guess what? I'd, I'm going out. I've trimmed the bushes. I've cleaned up some things in the house. And she even knows. I walk in. She's like, okay, what do you want? What is it? Because she knows me. There are other people that can look at our attitudes and they can know we're messed up. Even when we don't. So that's the reason we need the Lord to help us look at our heart. Because in Jeremiah 17, 9, which says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. In verse 10, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. In other words, God knows our heart. He knows it better than we do. So we need to come to him. And what we need to do is say, God, search me and try me. Now, when you pray that prayer, you better get ready. Because I'm telling you, God likes to meddle in your life. And when you open it up for him to meddle, he going to meddle. He's going to work in your life. He's going to show you areas where you're trying to please others instead of pleasing him. But we need the Holy Spirit to give us guidance and show us. Guys, I'll be honest with you. I kind of struggle with this. I've always kind of struggled with pleasing other people. More than pleasing God. I just said that out loud. Did you hear me say that? I can't believe I said it that way. Maybe I should. It hit me a few years ago when I was pastoring down in Picayune, Mississippi. I was going to seminary in New Orleans. I was driving back up and I was pastoring. Man, I'm just going to tell you, life was hectic. I was staying up all night studying I was trying to do what I could in the church. I was trying to make sure everything was going on. Some of y'all know. Y'all been there. Y'all, y'all know exactly how this goes, the busyness of the world. There was a guy in the church that I adored and loved. His name was Laverne Stewart. Mr. Laverne was the, um, well, it was the church treasurer. He was a trustee in the church. He was the Sunday school director. I'm talking about he was there all the time. As a matter of fact, some people thought he was Jesus. I kid you not. One of my little kids, not one of mine, but one of the little kids in the church, they came up to me one Sunday and they said, where's Jesus? I said, what are you talking about? Where's Jesus? I said, well, Jesus is all around here. Jesus is in the church. No, where's Jesus? I said, I'm telling you, Jesus is here. And they're like, no, I don't see him today. I see him every other day. And I said, what? Who are you talking about? Said that guy, that old guy that stands on the sidewalk, I give Jesus my money every day when I walk through. Every Sunday I walk through, I give it to him. Where is he? I said, well, let me tell you something. He ain't Jesus. He ain't even close. But he's a good man, and I'm grateful for you. And this, I mean, he was a wonderful guy. I loved him so much. Listen, I loved him so much. His name actually was Hayes Laverne Stewart. And I named my son Hayes after. But one day, I had come in from seminary. I'd been out ministering, doing things. Laverne was there because he was always there, like I told you. I, did I mention also he was the custodian and he cut the grass and did all the other stuff? He even cut my grass at the pastorium because he didn't think I had enough sense to get on the lawnmower, which is probably right. They don't teach that stuff in seminary. But um, I came in, I saw Laverne, and, and Laverne said, well, what have you been doing today? And then all of a sudden, I started listening. I made sure I got everything in. I had been to see three people at the hospital. I'd been here. I'd been there. I'd done this. I'd studied. I mean, I did all this stuff. I told him all that stuff, and then I walked away. And the Lord just prompted a question in my heart. Why did you do that? Why did you feel like you had to tell him everything that you've done? You know why? Because, one, I wanted to please him. Two, I wanted to justify my worth and my work. So I just told him everything I'd done. And the Lord said, that's unnecessary. It really did. He really like, man, he jumped on me that day. And what I've come to understand is 
I don't have to try to find my worth in pleasing other people. My worth is found in Jesus Christ. There are some people today that live for social media and they feel like they're worth something if they get so many likes or so many views or so many of those kinds of things. That's not going to help you. Your true worth is coming through knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and knowing that he loved you so much that he died on the cross for you and he rose again. He loved you that much. That's the only kind of worth that you need in life. But there are too many of us from time to time that we're trying to find that affirmation. My love language, according to Gary Chapman, some of you have read his book some years ago, Five Love Languages in a Relationship. My love language is words of affirmation. So I already know I'm bent toward that. Leslie, not so much. She is acts of service. Because I'm one of those, like, I'll look at Leslie and I say, I love you, baby. And she's like, that's fine. Would you take out the trash and show me? I mean, you can say that all day long. But I'm words of So I know I'm bent toward that. I know I have this issue in my life of where I want to please other people. I want to try to um, make other people happy. But this is what the proverb says. Proverbs chapter 27, 21, the New Living Translation says, Fire tests the purity of silver and the furnace for gold, but people are tested by their praise. In other words, your character is truly tested by the way you receive praise from other people. And the way people talk about you, and the way, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to handle it in a humble way and point them to the Lord? Or are you going to be like, you, you know what, you got something. I am, pretty, I am a pretty special individual. I, this, yeah. Are you going to do your righteous deeds to be seen by other people or to be seen by God? Lloyd-Jones, the old British preacher of years ago, he said... Ultimately, our pleasing other, pleasing other people is really just a manifestation of our self-gratification. We can say that we want to please other people, but really what we want to do is we want to please other people so they affirm us, so then that way we are gratified. While we say it's for other people, it really just comes back to us. You and I need to do some self-examination. That's going to take an individual effort. Hey, Verse 1 of chapter 6 again. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. That word you is plural. I probably ought to translate it for you. This is what it ought to say. Take heed that y'all do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, y'all have no reward from your Father in heaven. He started in a plural way in verse 1. But you know what I saw when I looked at this passage in verse 2? In verse 2, that when you, that you is singular. In other words, I'm talking to all of you, but I want to talk to you individually. Singular. This is for you. Not just looking around saying, well, this is who we are. No, I'm talking about who you are, who I am individually. So we practice self-examination. And if necessary... We practice secrecy in our lives. Now let me try to flesh that out for you. Let me say, give you two disclaimers. One, that does not mean that we should not give publicly. This does not prohibit public giving. It does not. It doesn't. Uh, if this prohibits public giving, then verse 5, 6, and 7 would prohibit public praying verse 16 17 and 18 would prohibit public fasting obviously we believe it's okay to pray publicly we've done it in this service today Zach prayed earlier he is a sinner I know he is and that would have been a big sin if we had said hey you're not supposed to be praying publicly but you did pray publicly right but that wasn't the, that wasn't the sin that you had committed there are others you've committed today but not that one right speak to your pastor yes thank you Thank you. It does not prohibit public giving. It's not what this means. It does not mean that you 
shouldn't live your faith publicly. That's not what this means either. We got too many people that claim to be undercover Christians. We're not to be undercover Christians. But what I mean is, if you've, got a, if you've got an issue in this area where what you are doing is just simply to please other people, just do it outside their sight so they can't see it, and then you don't have to worry about it. You just practice secrecy. He says, when you go on doing this charitable deed, in other words, you're going to, he says, decisively. The way this is stated for us is you make a decision not to allow your left hand to know what your right hand is doing. If you got a problem with your motivation and attitude, one of the ways you can combat that attitude is just doing it secretly. Do it in secret, he says, verse 4. Maybe this is the way I could say it. I wrote this down this week as I thought about it. If you're trying to, have, if you're, if you're trying to hide your attitude, just go ahead and hide your action. If your motivation... If you're trying to mask your motivation, because that's what they're doing, right? They're in the theater, they're hypocrites, they're actors. If you're trying to mask your motivation, just mask your movement so people can't see it. Just practice secrecy. Just, just don't do it. Just restrain yourself. There are times, hey, hey, are there not times when you just want to tell somebody how much you really know? When they talk about a subject and you like, you, you see... And, and you realize you know more than they do. But you know what you can do sometimes? Just keep your mouth closed. Because you're not going to do it for a good reason. You're going to do it for your glory, not for God's glory. Some of those moments when you want to like, you're thinking, hey, I'm going to put this on social media. And there are many days I want to put some things on social media. But it's going to be more for you than it is for God. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Hey, I really struggle with this sometimes because sometimes I'm like, man, I want people to know more about some of the church things that are going on and this and this. But then God really rocks me and says, are you doing that really to glorify him in the church? Or do you really want to just see your name in those headlines? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to post that, Lord. If we have issues with it, just practice secrecy. This week I've been gone a little bit. I've been traveling. And I did study. Some of you may think, oh, he hadn't even studied for this sermon. Yeah, I did this, this week some. And I even did a little study on birds. I don't know why. I just I thought about it when I was le reading this passage. I, I went and read a little bit more about peacocks. You know, like a peacock? Like, I mean, a peacock. A peacock's pretty. It's beautiful. I didn't know this until I was reading through the different material. And listen, preachers knowing a little about things, that is dangerous. But I went and read a little bit about it, and I know a little. A peacock actually refers to the male peafowl. I didn't know that. They're peafowls. And you got a peacock and you got a peahen. The peacock has the feathers. And the feathers actually are longer than the body like the body itself. And you can tell, like, the beautiful plumage and feather. I mean, you got the feathers, the colors, and that's there to attract, right? It's supposed to attract the peahen. And it's really just there for show. Now, these peacocks, they can fly, but they can't fly far. As a matter of fact, those feathers are just really there to attract other people. They're not too helpful in anything else. I prayed we got too many Christian peacocks in the church today. I'm not talking about just our church. I'm talking about the church. They're strutting around for everybody to see them. I did a little study on a pelican this week. The brown pelican. The pelican, that's our state bird. You know that? And did you just hear me say that? Our state bird. Some of you may not know this, but I'm from Mississippi. So uh, thanks be to God, he brought me here to Reston and Louisiana. I got here as fast as I could. Um, and now I can uh, adopt a state. So the pelican, 
The brown pelican. I'm going to tell you, the brown pelican, now I know that's a younger one, I think. I think when they're older, they are all brown. The pelican is not the best looking bird. And if you watch it walking around like on land, it is awkward. It is very much awkward. But you know what I learned about these brown pelicans is that they love community. They're very loyal. You know why we put them on our state flag? And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but state flag, there's the pelican. It's a mother pelican, and she's plucking at her breast in order to, well, I think from what I've read, she's trying to feed her children. It's like self-sacrifice. Some people believe she's just trying to pluck the feathers and build the nest, but the nest is already built. The babies are there on the flag, um, and she's trying to feed them from herself. And that's the reason... Louisiana put her on there. It was self-sacrifice. They look rather awkward when they're walking around. But oh man, when they're flying. We need some more pelicans in the church. Not as many peacocks. We need pelicans. They're just about community. Self-sacrifice. They're not strutting around with their feathers. They're just taking care of business. And when they fly, they fly by the Holy Spirit's work and the grace of God, and that's when you see grace. My friends, we need some pelicans. We need some pelicans in the church. Let me finally just give this to you. Because we practice some self-examination, we practice some secrecy, we really just need to practice some singularity. What do I mean by that? That means we just need a singular purpose. The singular purpose, pleasing Christ Jesus. Now, I didn't rehearse this with Coach Jackson, so I hope you're okay with this, all right? And if I'm off in my illustration, don't correct me in front of everybody, please. Okay, you can tell me afterwards. But I would think, you as players, you got kind of one person you need to please. That's Coach Jackson. Now, don't get me wrong. You might want to be there for your team members and please your team members. You might want to please these other coaches. But you know the, the one that's making the decision whether you're going to play or not, right? Because you, I mean, you're making the call, right, Coach? You better be pleasing the coach. Like, he better be the one. When we own God's team, you and I need to be pleasing pleasing the coach you can have everybody else on the team with you but the other ones they're not making decisions about your life there's only one that's the coach there's only one you need to be pleasing and that is Jesus Christ our Lord he's the only one you're going to get caught up you're going to hear other voices I think about it from day in and day out there's so many different voices I hear even here in the church and look, I would love to please everybody. I realize I can't because I'd be torn in so many different directions. So it's just, just better for me to say I'll please the coach. Please Christ. And for your life, you need to practice that singularity. I'll please the coach. It's not my glory. It's his glory. Oh, I need to probably say this out loud. You know God doesn't exist for you. You exist for God. God's not primed up so that you get glory God's primed up to show his glory through you do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5 16 oh some of you looking down you gonna make me go back and start the sermon on the mount again I've already been in it five months it's gonna be eternity before you get out of Matthew if you keep on Matthew 5 16 says what let your light shine before men so there is the public testimony he says let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven in other words everything that you do should point them back to him because you are pleasing him as someone said so well we lose the approval of God when we live for the applause of men Friends, it is about his glory. This week, I did something pretty simple. 
But I took my Bible, and I don't ever write in my Bible. I just don't. Man, I was raised, it was like, now I'm not saying you shouldn't. I think you ought to highlight it. You ought to, this is just one of my hang-ups, and I'm still getting over my parents and kind of stuff and all. But this week I took a pen, and I drew a little smiley face right on the inside. Just on the front. And mate, I'm not an artist. I know you, some of you look like, is that a smiley face? I'd encourage you to take your Bible, maybe draw a little smiley face on the inside. What I wrote under it was this. Please God, make him smile. Delight him daily. So when I open my Bible, I can see a smiley face. And remember, the reason I'm even studying is not so I'm studying to give people, oh, all this great information. I want to study in order to please him and love him and know him more. Delight in him and allow him to delight in you. Because this is what it says about the singular reward. He said, these individuals that have done this, trumpeted themselves and their activities, guess what? They've already got their reward. Now, it's still a reward. It is. People tell you how great you are, how good you are. That feels good. But it only lasts until you hear somebody else tell you that. Actually, no, it doesn't last the moment. You need somebody else then to tell you that in order to get that reward again because it's just fleeting. It's just temporary. But he says, those who practice even in secrecy, the Father goes on seeing, present tense. He sees everything. He goes on noting it. He knows. And he will reward. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 said it this way. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name. God's not going to forget. God has a way of remembering these things. And he says there's a reward. Now, as Zach prayed earlier, you and I are not saved through our works. No way, no way, no way. You can never be good enough. I sure couldn't be good enough. It's not going to happen. That's the reason Jesus came and died for us and rose again, right? He died the death that I should have died so that I can live the life that he lives through me. I'm thankful for that grace. And the way you have to come to it is through faith. You have to trust him. That's the only way. You're never going to measure up any other way. But after you're saved, you get to do good works. As Tony Evans said this week, as I heard him speak, he said, you don't just do good things, you do good works. It's different. Good works incorporate Christ Jesus into those good things. It shows the gospel. So you do good works. And when you do good works, even in secret, the Father knows. And I don't know how this is going to happen one day. You know, I've read the scripture and I, I'm still working on it on this, but there is a reward even for faithfulness. It might be in our capacity to enjoy it. I don't know how he's going to work it out, but there is a reward the Bible speaks about. Not only the reward of heaven because of salvation, but there is a reward because of service. And that's what he says. The Father who goes on seeing all things, he notes it. He will re reward you in his own time, in his own way. So let me come back to the question. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Some of you say, well, I hadn't been doing things for the right reason. Well, that's, that's cool. You got a lot of us to join in here. But you also can join us, not just in recognizing it, but saying, God, we want to do something. As your Holy Spirit works in our life, we want to do what's right before you. And we want to do it for the right reason. Help us. Now, first, you got to be saved. You can't do good works until you come to the good one. So you need to come and give your life to him. Submit yourself. Say, Lord, I want to follow you. And then as you follow him, follow him with everything you got. If the old ego starts creeping up on you, just do those good things in secret. 
but still keep doing them. Because what we're striving for is the singularity of heart of pleasing God and seeing His reward in our hearts and lives. And it's not something that will just fade in and out like a compliment. It's something that will be eternal. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in here today. I pray for some of us that just need a rearrangement of our heart, transformation. Lord, we're showing up at church, trying to do good things during the week, but Lord, just be honest with you, we're doing it because we have to, or we're doing it because we want other people to just know we're doing it. But God, I just pray today, you just invade us. Help us to do it just simply to please you. God, for those that may not know you here in this place, give them the liberty to just come down and talk to me or to George. Or just, Lord, just to reach out to somebody so that they might know you before they leave this place. God, take this invitation, this moment of commitment, and help us focus on you. Help us to walk out of here not only in better actions, but Lord, with a better attitude of service for you. We pray it now. And really the only name that matters, and certainly the only name we want to please, that is the name of Jesus. We pray it in his name. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for worship. What an awesome morning of worship we had. I know the Lord's blessed you just uh, getting to celebrate baptism and just a, a wonderful time. Thanks for our pastor being back in the pulpit this morning. What a great message from him. I know you were blessed by that. We want to give you a moment just to respond uh, to what you've heard. Maybe even just seeing the baptism uh, this morning uh, has made you wonder. Maybe you've never been baptized. If you'd like to follow through uh, and talk to someone about what it means to be baptized, why don't we do that? Uh, we'd love to visit with you and counsel you through that, pray with you through that. Or if you'd like to give your life to Christ this morning, you've never done that, don't know how to do that, uh, we'd just love for you to share what the Lord's doing in your life by filling out a digital communication card. And uh, we'll, we'll follow up with you this week and uh, get with you about your next steps and uh, what you need to do uh, to be faithful to the Lord. Uh, as he speaks to you. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements before we let you go uh, this morning. I posted uh, some links in the comment section for you. If um, you're new to Temple, we'd love for you just to fill out a digital communication card so we can know who you are and answer any questions you might have about Temple. If we can pray for you or with you this morning, uh, you can text NEEDS to 97000. We'd love to pray uh, with you. We'll gather those prayer requests and pray as a staff later this week uh, over those. And then lastly, if you'd like to give as part of your worship this morning, uh, then there's a giving link in the comment section, or you can text any amount that you'd like to give this morning to the number 84321. This uh, evening, we'll begin our senior adult Bible study Sunday night, tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll actually be in the sanctuary. Uh, Dr. Audra Smith is coming in to teach through Psalms, and uh, he is a great Bible teacher. Uh, this is something we do every August, and it's not just for senior adults. So if you are looking for something to do tonight, a time of worship, we'd love to have you at 6 here. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning at 9.30, uh, Dr. Smith will be with us. Uh, there's lunch on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so we'd love to have you uh, be a part of our senior adult Bible study uh, coming up this week. I know you'll be blessed uh, by it. Also, I want to tell you a little bit about another ministry in our church called Grief Share. Grief Share is a group of... Uh, ministry that has blessed so many people over the years who are struggling with grief and going through the grief process. Uh, you don't have to go through the grieving process alone. Uh, this is a group that will encourage you, that will help you uh, as you deal with the loss of a loved one um, or any type of loss. And uh, Keith Rowe leads this group, does a great job, and uh, I know you'll be blessed by that. We're starting this August 25th. And uh, the group will meet on Thursdays uh, from 2 to 3 in the afternoon in room 216. 
And uh, we'd love to have you be a part of this or someone you know who's struggling, who's lost a loved one recently uh, to go through uh, Grief Share with us. It's a 13-week uh, Bible study, so it goes on through November 17th every Thursday. And I uh, hope you'll join us or let someone know about that uh, opportunity. Thanks again for worshiping up with us this morning. Pray God will bless you today and you'll have a great week. If you can't join us in person next week, then I hope you'll uh, join us online same time. Uh, we'll be here. So God bless you and we'll see you soon.